so you got this thing down about the Pauline epistles. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing and since uh, with these general epistles. Again, the general epistles are not the Pauline epistles. General epistles are epistles written um, by, any, by someone other than Paul. Um, they're sometimes known as the um, Catholic epistles. Catholic meaning universal or, you know, uh, again, general, not, uh, not for um, that particular uh, faith. So Catholic epistles or general epistles. Now, since you have this down to an art, I'm only going to let you have a minute to do this. Okay, uh, you should be done by now, right? Or, yeah, right. Right? You're all done, right? Okay, good. Uh, because uh, if you've ever, I don't know about you, have you ever wished that you had a matching sheet where the answers went directly across? Well, this is it. <laughs> all the answers go directly across, and that's why you were only given a minute to do this. Because actually, you shouldn't even need a minute. Okay. So all the answers go straight across, um, so we won't have to do any kind of matching. But I want to go, uh, draw your attention to the book of Hebrews. Um, there are some indications of the book of Hebrews that uh, it looks like Pauline authorship, but not enough. And so oftentimes you will hear the authorship of Hebrews referred to as uh, the writer of Hebrews. You really can't identify um, that person specifically and um, most accurately. So the writer of Hebrews. I'd like you to turn uh, to your Bibles in, in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Uh, someone in the back row, loud, clear voice, would you read those three verses, please? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Thanks. In these three verses, one word or a cognate of one word is used three times. What word might that be? In these three verses, there's one word or a cognate of that one word that is used in each of the three verses. What word is that? Endured. Endured. Yeah, very good. Now, in, um, in language, in the English language, we generally ha we have more senses, but we generally have three senses, or rather uh, tenses, um, to our language. We have the past. What else? Present and future. Okay, past, present, and future. In the Greek, now we have it in English as well, but in the Greek, um, the use of the word endured in the third verse is used in a different tense. It is found in a perfect tense. A perfect tense means that something happened in the past that now has implications for the present. So this is what it reads um, in chapter 12, verse 3. Let him who endured much at the hands of evil men. Because you have um, grown weary and, and lost heart, consider him who endured much at the hands of evil men so that you will not lose heart. What the author is saying here is that what did Jesus suffer at the hands of evil men? This is not a trick question. Crucifixion. The crucifixion. Consider him who endured, pres, um, perfect tense, consider him who endured much at the hands of evil men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer is saying this, when he observes people who are walking away from the faith or just wanting to give up, he says this, this is the antidote. Consider him who endured much. Perfect tense, something that happened in the past that now has implications for the present. So if you're finding that you're growing weary and losing heart, that this thing called the Christian walk is difficult, then the antidote the author of Hebrews says, is to consider him. Consider Good Friday. Consider his suffering. Because so, uh, because so many have seen the passion of the Christ, and I've heard it described as graphic, bloody, horrible. I can't help but think that as Jesus in his 
earthly ministry suffered much. He would also teach much about the kingdom. And he often described the kingdom as the kingdom of God is like, and he would describe something that we would be able to understand. He tried to describe, and he did, describe something so huge, massive, and glorifying to something that we can understand on earth. Related to that, then I think that Jesus' physical suffering was perhaps a shadow of his spiritual suffering. That as we watch the passion of the Christ, that just shows you a little bit of what he suffered for us spiritually for us. So if you have an experience where you're growing weak and you're just tired, think about what Christ endured at the hands of sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So perhaps that's appropriate for this part of the semester. Think about what he suffered and allow yourselves to be encouraged uh, by that. Okay, uh, let's put away then the uh, epistles and I'll look forward to reading and receiving your um, sim papers on Ephesians 2 on Friday. I'm gonna change gears to Thanksgiving and actually it's kind of related to what we just looked at in, uh, in Hebrews, being thankful. Let's see if we have time. Um, As you looked at some of the passages that you chose, let's uh, popcorn this. Let me find out who did um, any of the passages, either 1 Timothy, from 1 Timothy 4, Psalm 107, Luke 17, Romans 1, or Romans 14. Anyone choose any of those? Okay. Uh, Christy, anyone else? And AJ, would you just go ahead and put uh, what you did up on the board far left? Anyone else take um, either Psalm 50, or Psalm 95, 1 Timothy 2, 2 Corinthians 9, or Ephesians 5. Anyone take that? All right. Is that Kelly? Come on up and um, add whatever you did, whichever one you addressed to the, to the board. Anyone else? Any of those? Okay. How about 1 Thessalonians 5 or Philippians 4, Colossians 3? Anyone choose any of those passages to look at? No one? What, uh, what blows my mind is um, in Psalm 33, 5, that word is used, hesed. And the psalmist describes hesed, God's hesed, as being everywhere. That we are immersed in a world filled with God's hesed. And yet, we don't see it. We don't recognize it. So this whole series of means of grace from the beginning, science and solitude, fasting, confession, prayer, has led up to, hopefully, a greater sensitivity to sensing God and his spirit and how he moves. So this Thanksgiving thing isn't just to sit down and, and write down what you're thankful for. It's a mindset of thinking, what is God doing? Who is he? And that what would our response to him be? It would be for Thanksgiving. It would be to thank him. And when we're thankful to him, it automatically shows up in how we're thankful for other people. Okay, Thanksgiving. Um, here's an introduction to the um, exercise, the means of grace of Thanksgiving. And you're gonna have to help me. Let's see um, if you can help me uh, spot these. So from the category of um, a duty of Thanksgiving to God, let's see, where it is either 1 Timothy 4, Psalm 107, Luke 17, Romans 1, or 14 up here. Which one? Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, Romans, nature in its, in, is in itself proof for the existence of God. When people say they are wise, yet they do not thank and praise God for what he has done, they are fools to the world. Ouch! When we don't thank God, we are fools to the world. And we don't thank him. It is our duty to thank him. Ah, but I would also say it is a delight to thank him. All right. Um, an expression of thanksgiving to God is, uh, let's see, Psalm 50. Help me out with this. Psalm 50, Psalm 95, 1 Timothy, 2 Corinthians, or Ephesians 5 up there. 
Psalm 50. Okay, good. The temple is only an avenue for worship to strengthen covenant relationship with God. The temple is only an avenue for worship to strengthen the covenant relationship with God. When I see this, I think of this. You are God's temple. You are now God's temple. And what is the temple designed to do? Worship and to strengthen that relationship. So Thanksgiving obviously then has a part in that. How about 1 Thessalonians, oh good, 5.18. Uh, believers are called to give thanks in all circumstances. Now there's a difference here in thanking him for all circumstances versus thanking him in all circumstances. Sin will always be sin and evil will always be evil. We don't have to thank God for that but we can thank God in circumstances where we face sin and evil. We can still hang on to and give him praise and thanksgiving in those circumstances, but not necessarily for. We need to recognize that seeming aggravations are but a temporary part of a larger plan for our spiritual well-being. It will grow us. Uh, but we are to give thanks in all circumstances. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, did that one show up? No? Okay. If you looked at 1 Corinthians 15, um, 57, you would find that thanksgiving is given for the blessings of salvation. Uh, Matthew 14, let's see, what do we have? Acts 28, uh, that's uh, by Paul, or Paul, about Paul, where Paul is found giving thanksgiving. And do we have Matthew 14? Nope. And how about Revelation 4? Nope. Okay. Well, let's look at these other ones too. Um, Psalm 95, you should prepare yourself to enter the presence of God when you come to worship and give thanks. Um, again, through these means of grace, we probably have sensed just growing familiar uh, with being in the presence of God growing familiar with being in the presence of God. And thanksgiving occurs there. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, for two reasons supporting Paul's opposition to a theologically based asceticism. God's creation is good, which implies that we can eat all that God has made, giving him thanks. We must eat with thanksgiving what God has created. And I hope it's more than saying grace before each meal and the expression of a general spirit of gratitude in table blessings. How unfortunate it is when you are late to a table and everyone has their thumbs up so that they don't have to pray. How unfortunate that giving thanks has come to something like that. Are you familiar with what I've just described? People would say, oh, who's gonna pray? And everyone at the table puts their thumbs up because they don't wanna pray. And so the last person to get their thumbs up is the one who is relegated to the loser, and the loser has to pray. How unfortunate what Christians are doing with regard to giving thanks to God. How unfortunate. Um, I hope that that would be different in your lives. That mindful of who God is and what he has already done and what he continues to do, cultivates a heart of thanksgiving. Not just at a meal and not just one day a year, but this is how we decide to live in a thankful, a position of great thankfulness to God. And don't be surprised if this ends up affecting how you are thankful to other people for very simple things that you are able to observe, that God enables you to observe in the course of your days. So your exercise of biblical thanksgiving is to spend time with God and to acknowledge what he has done. Really spend some significant time with him. And would you observe if there's any difference in how you react and respond to other people? Mm -hmm.
Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.